Welcome to Music and Medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Moshe Lewis. I'm really excited. We're in the presence of music royalty today with Claude McKnight from Take Six. The music is just legendary. What they accomplished is simply incredible. And we're going to sort of dive into that story a bit. Thanks for joining me, young man. It's my pleasure. Sure, sure. Great to be here. Yeah, I mean, so you wouldn't know that I come from a tiny town called Brooklyn um, or that I went to school upstate. I'm not quite in Buffalo, but I've been there many times. Okay. So I wanted to talk about your journey from Brooklyn to Buffalo to, of all places, Huntsville, Alabama. Okay, so I was born in Brooklyn. Uh -huh. My father's from Brooklyn. Right, so I okay. I was born in Kings County Hospital. Right, right, that's... Yep, so we were there, and then my brother Freddie was born. Right. But my parents went to school in Huntsville, Alabama. Right. Oh, okay, that's very Yeah, awesome. they went to okay. Oakwood University, yes. which was Oakwood College back then. Yes, yes. And um, my third brother, huh. Michael, was born right. in Huntsville. My father okay. went back to school right. to get his degree. Sure, sure, sure. So after wow. that, um, when my parents got married um, right uh, right before I was born, sure, right. uh, <laughs> we moved from um, from Alabama uh -huh. to um, to Buffalo. Right, right. And that's where sure. Brian was born. Yes. Okay. So a lot of my formative years were in Buffalo, which mm -hmm. is crazy because mm -hmm. We didn't really like Buffalo right, right. growing up. <laughs> and you're not alone, right? You know, but there was so much great music there. Mm, mm -hmm, you know, you had um, Rick James. All okay, right. From, from that area. Up, okay. From that area. Right, right, right. Wow. So we grew up listening to that. And I think Chuck Mangione and people mm, like that. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. I'm from that era where, you sure. know, all of this music was happening in Buffalo. Right. And I went to some amazing junior and senior high schools. Sure. Right. So my music experience was great. And my my uh, mother's father, my mm -hmm. grandfather, mm -hmm. was the uh, the uh, director of the gospel choir okay. of the church. So that's right, where right, I right. really learned sure. my music. Right. And then how did that love or appreciation for jazz develop at relatively a young age? Because that's not something even today we always see as common. So I think what really happened was growing up, um, we come from the Seventh Day Adventist Church. Okay, that's a very conservative religion. Yes, yes. So there wasn't a lot of rhythm and stuff going on, but there was sure. tons of harmony. Okay, <laughs> you're very so polite. That, okay. So we went crazy with harmony growing right. up. Sure. And my parents had some really eclectic albums growing up. We had all that Nat King Cole stuff. Right. Sure. Johnny Mathis stuff. Right. We had um, what was um, the Walter Artis Chorale. Okay. And Walter Artis was this this big guy in the Seventh Day Adventist Church, mm -hmm. but he had these choirs that would do six, seven, eight part harmony. Right. Wow. So I grew up from like five, six years old listening to this stuff, and that was commonplace for us. Sure. So that's where it really honed our ears. And if I'm not mistaken, you all were sort of putting together, not really trying to get seek the limelight, but groups really early on. Oh yeah, my mm -hmm. brothers and I. So right. there's four of us. I'm right. the oldest and Brian's the youngest. So exactly. it was the McKnight Brothers Quartet. Right, right. Growing up. Sure. So I sang bass in that group. Right. And Brian was our like our little Michael Jackson mm -hmm. at like mm -hmm. seven years old. Right, right, right. Um, so it was funny because Brian tells this in, in interviews a lot as well. Our family, everybody extended sings. Right. So it wasn't until we got to school that we realized that everybody couldn't sing. Right, right. You realize. You know, we were like, wait a minute, what's right. going on right. here? Not everybody has a sound. Mm -hmm. So now, what inspired you, besides the fact your family had gone there, to go to Oakwood? Because it's not exactly maybe a school that would spring to mind, especially if you were considering going into one type of music mm -hmm. versus another. Yeah, so I grew up playing the trombone. Right. I was a jazz trombone, right. and that's what I wanted to do. In sure. fact, my goal was I wanted to be in the Tonight Show band. Okay. Like Doc Severinsen. Right. Okay. So I was an orchestrator. I was like, I'm going to Eastman School of Music, sure. all that kind of all stuff. Time, yes. But since my parents went to Oakwood, sure. I said, well, let me go for a year. Okay. Just see. The year. crazy right. thing about Oakwood, though, was they didn't have a great band for Right. Me. Right. So I started a vocal group, and that's exactly. where I started Take Six. Sure. So apparently that's, it was meant to be. Right, and that wasn't something uncommon there as well. You had right. lots of vocal groups there. Mm -hmm. And so um, what sort of gave you all that special panache or bond or okay. feeling, hey, we need to work together? Yeah. So when I was a freshman, I started a quartet. Right. Basically barbershop, doo-wop style stuff. Yeah. And there were, like you said, a ton of other groups there that did that kind of stuff. So, because I had that background in easy listening music and yes. jazz music, yeah. I ran into a gentleman named Mark Kibble. Okay. And Mark came into the large bathroom where we were rehearsing one day. 
and added a fifth part to what we were doing. We were like, right. yo, <laughs> what is this? <laughs> right. And then we got one more person because sure. I, Mark had this uncanny ability of creating vocal arrangements that sounded like big band music. Yes. And so that differentiated us from all the other groups because nobody right. was doing what we were doing. Sure. And wasn't it also pretty unique to even have six people? Yes. Performing? Yeah, because there were tons of trios mm -hmm. and quartets and, of course, choirs. I don't think there were any other sextets on campus, not at that time. Right. And how did that give you all more range in terms of the types of things you could do because you had more members? Well, as far as arrangements were concerned, um, we could do things where it could be a full choral arrangement with six-part harmony where everybody's kind of doing the same thing throughout. Or we could have a walking bass line sure. and three parts and then, you know, another person singing the lead or whatever. Sure. So there were right. all kinds of different combinations we could do with six that we couldn't do with five and certainly not four. Sure. You also appear very modest and it doesn't seem like you were seeking the limelight. How did this whole showcase get put together that kind of really catapulted you into you, you've outer done space? Your, you've done your homework. Hey. Okay. So we... Um, had basically just graduated out of Oakwood. Right. And we reached out to uh, a woman named Gail Hamilton, mm -hmm. who lived in Nashville, and okay. we said, uh, we'd like to try to pursue this. Can you put a showcase together? We didn't even right. know what a showcase was. Sure, right, right. And what is a showcase? Just for it's those basically it's an industry term. where you send out all these invitations okay. to industry people for a show that you're going to do. Right. It's free. If sure. they show up, they do. If they right. don't, well, you're doing <laughs> sure. a show for nobody. <laughs> right, so I could do it anyway. And we probably had five people there. Right. And in fact, interestingly enough, at one point we probably had about ten. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. right before the show, some of the Christian record mm -hmm. labels are like, right. yeah, no, we're not going to sure. stay. Right. And we Why? were like, um, <laughs> Right. Why are they leaving? Okay. But then sure. unbeknownst to us, uh -huh. the vice president of Warner Brothers Records in Nashville right. came to that showcase, sure. listened, and right after we sang, he said, I love what you guys do. Mm -hmm. I have no clue what we'll do with it, sure. but I would like to sign you. And so the next day we signed, and 21 sure. days later we were in the studio. Right. And I want to tease that out because how would you even... Uh, characterize the music at that time because it really wasn't R&B per se, mm -hmm. which was so, sort of a lot more common in terms of people signing mm -hmm. urban groups. How would you um, how would you have characterized it? Because you all had such a unique sound for that time. Right. So at the time, we may have known ten songs. Right. And they were all like Negro spirituals. Right. <laughs> you know, and we sure. just basically arranged them in jazz and big band acapella style mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and we wrote two songs sure. for the album which were gold mine and spread love yes and in fact yes. spread love is the very first song i ever had, had a hand in writing right, right. so mm -hmm. we basically did what we knew sure warner brothers had no clue what to do with it and in sure. fact when i say nashville it was the country music division of warner brothers right. i can imagine so sure. imagine this young African-American acapella jazz gospel group being signed right. to a country music right. label. Sure. So I think that was a blessing in disguise because mm -hmm. no one was there to say, uh, you right. need to do this a little differently or can you stop saying God or whatever. Yeah, sure. They let us do what we we're going to do. Sure. And how did that wind up being an incredible opportunity? Because it seems that you all were able to be sheltered, nurtured, but also not taken advantage of, which is so rare often with a group that essentially really were novice. Yeah. So for us, it was amazing because, as I said, the vice president signed us. It was his pet project. Right. And he told us, he was like, if you guys sell 15,000 copies, that's good for me because right. I love the music. Mm -hmm. That album has gone on to sell like almost three million copies. Right, right. And when I tell you it costs nothing to make that album, <laughs> right. <laughs> it costs nothing. Sure. So to answer your question though, um, I think because we were in Nashville, right. and it was so long ago, this was 1987 when we got right. signed, sure. um, the music business hadn't changed yet mm -hmm. into like the 90s and into the 2000s where there was a ton of money right. involved and a lot of accountants and stuff getting mm -hmm. into the business of music. Mm -hmm. So for us, not only was Nashville involved, but New York and LA. So we were dealing with um, 
Mo Austin and people like that who right. were the stalwarts of Warner Brothers Records and mm -hmm. they were musicians. Right. So they really dug the fact that we did music. Right. You know, we weren't trying to put stuff together that um, that didn't make sense musically. Right. But it also sounds you all were very intelligent and did your homework, got lawyered up, and really mm -hmm. got a lot of things built into an early contract that sometimes people to this day don't have despite having many decades in the business. Um, how did you all have that insight and foresight? A lot of that happened with our first manager, mm -hmm. and that was Gail Hamilton. Right. Because after we got that um, showcase and we got the deal. We were like, uh, right. what do Gail, we would you manage us? And she wasn't a manager. Right. But she created a company mm -hmm. and learned on the job training. And she's a Christian and a really, really amazing woman. So I think she was kind of our den mother mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and made sure that her boys right. didn't get taken advantage of. Sure. How did that create unique experiences for other groups that kind of followed in your wake? Well, you know, we've heard over time mm -hmm. you know, there were groups who who listen to us, you know, people like boys to men and people yes. like that. Right. Um, how true that is, I don't know. Sure. You know I, I sat sure. next to Usher sure. on a plane and he talked about how our music was really influential to him. Sure. And you don't know these things no. when you're doing it. Right. You know what I mean? We ran into Alice Cooper sure. oh. one time. <laughs> wow. Okay. In <laughs> in um in uh Poland sure. of right. all places. And he's right. singing Oh Mary Don't You Weep. <laughs> so you don't know mm. um the the breadth and the scope of what what your career is doing sure. until other people tell you. Sure. You're just trying to make sure you do what makes sense to you. Yeah. So on that note and teasing that out, what was that secret sauce and formula? Not only that kept you all together, but made the music work when it was so unique. Um, I think quite honestly, the fact that we have a common denominator and that mm -hmm. is actually loving the Lord. Right. You know, and we've had to learn what that actually means. Because I can say that, sure. and it can mean a lot of different things depending on what experience you're having at any given moment. Mm -hmm. But since we've been in this now for, what, 35, 36 years, and we're extremely transparent with one another. Sure. So we've gone through marriages, divorces, births, deaths, right. sure. you know, all manner of stuff. So we are family. Mm -hmm. I think that's what keeps us together is that we actually respect each other. Sure. Even the sure. times we don't like each other. Sure. It's hard to keep a group together, right. even when you love each other. Sure, right. So imagine, you know, so we've been through some stuff, but because we respect each other and that common denominator is there, it, it keeps us together. Right. Aretha sang about that song, Respect, but I want to tease that out even more. What does it really mean in terms of what somebody is bringing to the group, um, if somebody's writing, somebody's producing, and things like that, and really basically allowing everybody to have a voice regardless of their technical contributions? So that's a great question. I think what's, what has been important for us is no one person in this group is more important than any other. Even though, to be honest with you, Mark Kibble is the sound of the group, right. his personality is such that he doesn't impose his will on right. any of us. Sure. Even when I want him to, I'm like, Mark, <laughs> come right. on, man. You know? So I think we are such a democracy mm -hmm. that we're able to lift each other up in many ways, not just musically, but spiritually, emotionally, financially even. Mm -hmm. You know, we make sure that everybody is feeling important in this. Because if you have a spoke in your wheel right. that is broken, the wheel can't roll. Right. You know, so I think that's what's so important in this group. Some people would even go so far as to say that the industry often seems to pick someone out of mm -hmm. a group and put them on a pedestal, and mm -hmm. then that starts to create tension, whether it's a family that right. was together or not. Um, how do you all think you were able to avoid some of that? Probably the honest answer to that is we were so young and naive mm -hmm. at what we were doing. We got in a an incredible amount of success early. Right. But the success was in the fact that this group was so unique that I don't think anybody was able to say, well, as unique as you are, we need to pick this guy out of here right. and sure. do whatever. Yeah. People had no clue what we were doing, sure. to be honest with sure. you. Sure. And I think that that was good for us and it was good for the industry as well. Sure. You know. You said that the young man that signed you had no greater expectations than 15,000 sales. How did it feel 
to win Grammys first out of the gate? It was crazy because that first album was nominated for three Grammys. Right. We won two. two. And three of the guys were still in school. And that was like finals week <laughs> right. when we're winning Grammys. You know, so it was hilarious. And our career took off so quickly, quickly that we didn't really have a chance to sit down and, you know, marinate in this. Sure. Yeah. You know, because even to this day, it's not like we are um, a group that is hugely successful um, as far as number of albums sold. I think we're right. more critically successful. Mm -hmm. Right. And most people know of us, like especially in the music business itself. Right. So I think that also is a buffer for us that we're more loved within the community. Sure. And I think people know who we are, but there are a lot bigger groups as far as album sales and notoriety. So, so I think that has sure. kept our heads in, in, in shape as well. Sure. When you're on the road and touring, you mentioned Poland and going overseas, what is that experience like now? Um, and sort of receiving that uh, love from the fans and things like that who have stuck with you um, through all the years and maybe coming to know you even. So w what we found is that especially being a vocal group and primarily an a cappella group, we get a lot of our energy from the audience. Yes. You know, we have what we have on stage, but what they give back to us makes everything just rise to another level. Sure. So early in our career, it was interesting because we didn't know how to handle that. Sure. You know, and you might be in Italy in a place right. where they don't really speak English very well, right. and you're not getting the love you think right. you're supposed to get. Sure. Right. And then the song is over, and they go crazy, and you're like, right. "Oh, I guess we were getting it." Right. You know, so you have to find a balance mm -hmm. to what makes sense for you to to uh, to do what you do. Sure. Besides touring, and I know you and I were you were so kind to stay in touch and things like that, despite a, a complex tour schedule. What things are keeping you busy now, and what things you look forward to? So we are in the midst of working on a straight ahead jazz album. Okay. This will be the first one of those. Even though people associate Take Six with being a jazz group, sure. I don't know what you would call us. We're a vocal group that um, does spiritually based music. Right. That is you know, extended jazz type chords. Right. But we're doing songs like Giant Steps and God Bless the Child mm -hmm. and and Rhapsody in Blue. Mm -hmm. I mean, some right. serious jazz yes. classics. Yeah. Yes. So we're in the midst of that now. And we also have been farming out some of the arrangements to other people, which is a first for us as well. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. No, it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, our show is called Music and Medicine. When you hear those words, how does that speak to you? So it's interesting because I think that music is medicine. Mm -hmm. you know, it absolutely is. I think it's the one thing that any person can go back in time and remember where they were, how they were feeling, yes. what something smelled like, what something tasted like, based on a certain song. Right. You know, and songs can lift you. The chords within that song can lift you. Obviously, the lyrics play a, um, a big um, role in that. But music is so scientific yes. and emotional exactly. and um, physiological. Sure. All at the same All time. All is medicine. Right. Yeah. No, you're right. I mean, that's mm -hmm. a great way of putting it. Um, where can we find you and uh, try to catch up with your schedule and things like that? So Take Six, you can find us at, uh, on Facebook at you know, Take Six Official. Sure. You can find us at Take6.com. Um, uh, take Six Official on Twitter and Instagram, and me personally, sure. uh, anywhere you see Claude McKnight, sure. you know, that's on Facebook, right. that's on Instagram, that's on, I do a lot of stuff on TikTok for okay. some reason. Okay, hey, a lot of stuff. It I get a lot of love <laughs> over there. Sure. Um, and also, uh, I, I'm a vocal coach, sure. and I have a program out called uh, Building Blocks of the Song sure. Stylist, nice. so people can reach me there. Speaking of um, teaching and mentoring, what is that advice you'd give to young groups that are starting out, um, given that, like you said, the landscape of music has gotten so much more complex in terms of trying to stay together and trying to navigate the business of music? So because it's so complex and everybody can get out there and do some kind of music now, yeah. I would say be unique. Right. Find what is unique about you and lean into that because when you become too homogenous or sounding like somebody else, you get lost in the shuffle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And specifically with groups, I think what's really important, depending on how many people you have, 
you always want to have somebody in that group who is so recognizable vocally that anytime that group is heard people know it's that group mm -hmm. you know I think the Temptations had that really well right right you know sure, yeah. um, so I think they're a model to look at mm -hmm. like that I think take six has that mm -hmm. you know and not because we have so many amazing uh, lead vocalists but because of the sound itself you know so we're very different from any other acapella group and there are specific reasons why right what do you enjoy most yourself about music and just uh, being able to be part of it in terms of your profession man that's another great question for me music is everything Mm -hmm. I sing all day long. In fact, my, my sure. daughters are like, Dad, <laughs> please, man, can you shut up? <laughs> you know? I'm always thinking of a song. Yeah. Always. And in fact, when I go watch a movie or whatever, sure. I can be in the movie crying my eyes out sure. because of the song. So, right, sure. Exactly. You know, music is so emotional to me, and I think I got a lot of that from my mom's side of the family. Yeah. Because everybody is so emotionally connected to music. Yeah. I, I don't know what so, I would do without music. Sure, no, absolutely. Well, we don't know what we do without your music. Like I said, I started listening uh, when I was in college, mm -hmm. and uh, it was just um, it was amazing because it was just so different. I mean, although, like you said, I, all of us had heard some acapella here or mm -hmm. there, it was always sort of like the opening act, usually for something else. Um, it wasn't the main course, and I feel like your performances and the elevation certainly of a lot of our music, which some people may have forgotten, um, really sort of brought it to a prominence that we could never have even imagined. We're like, who is this? How are they doing this? <laughs> and uh, to be able to sit down with you, it's truly an honor and a pleasure. So I appreciate your Man, time. Thank you. And your candor. All right. I appreciate it. Thanks you. so much. All right. Okay.